Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this afternoon's Grand Rounds. Um, today's Grand Rounds is by two of our PGY3 residents, uh, Dr. Uh, Muath Alas uh, uh, Dr. Muath Alicia and Dr. Madi Darab. The topic of uh, today's Grand Rounds is uh, the role of corticosteroids in severe community acquired pneumonia, evidence in recent trials. Uh, just before we start, I'm just going to give a brief uh, bio of Dr. Alessia and Dr. Dahrab. Uh, Moat Alessia is a PGY3 internal medicine resident here at McMaster. He has a strong interest in respirology with a focus on pulmonary hypertension and ILD. He has matched to <clears throat> respirology here at McMaster and will be continuing his training here for another two years. Dr. Madi Darab is a PGY3 internal medicine resident here at McMaster as well. He has a strong interest in cardiology. He's passionate about advancing his expertise in cardiovascular care and looks forward to continuing uh, the field through his clinical practice and further specialization. Madi is also matched to cardiology here at McMaster, and we will be seeing him for uh, here for another three years. Um, so thank you very much, and I'm going to hand this over to uh, Madi and Moath. Yeah, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us in today's Grand Round. Um, I'd like uh, to acknowledge uh, and to take this moment to acknowledge that we are privileged to provide like, this the care here in the lands that indigenous people have called home for thousands of years. Um, so in today's topic, we'll discuss, uh, as Dr. Pandrew mentioned, the role of corticosteroids in severe community acquired pneumonia. Um, we'll, we'll have a um, couple of randomized control trials that we will share, uh, as well as one systematic review about this topic. Um, so this uh, this presentation is supervised by Dr. Kiribo. She's the um, an assistant professor in the Department of Respirology. Um, so this is our objectives for today's talk. Um, we'll review the latest guidelines and recommendation about the role of steroids in community acquired pneumonia. Um, we'll review the um, effectiveness as well as the safety of steroids as an adjunct therapy. Um, we'll uh, summarize this, the outcomes such as mortality, the time to clinical stability, the ICU length of stay. As I said, we'll review um, a couple of randomized control trials and a systematic review about this topic. So uh, just uh, briefly talking about community acquired pneumonia. Um, so as, as we all know, this is um, an acute infection that involves the pulmonary parenchyma. Um, and uh, it has to be acquired in the community. This is in contrast to the hospital-acquired pneumonia, which happens 48 hours or more after hospitalization. Um, this uh, disease or this um, the pneumonia usually is associated with significant morbidity and mortality, uh, as we can see in this meta-analysis that was published in the 1996, mortality can reach up to 13.6 in hospitalized patients uh, and up to 36.5% in people who get admitted to the ICU. Um, so overall, um, there, there is a need for adjunctive therapy uh, to try to reduce this mortality rate. Um, why steroid in this uh, disease? As we all know, there is there are a couple of um, recent evidence about the role of steroids in a couple of infectious diseases, um, including the role of steroids in COVID pneumonia, the role of steroid in septic um, shock. Um, so uh, we'll try to see if there is any role of steroid in uh, pure community acquired pneumonia. Um, and uh, steroids overall um, can have an effect on reducing the progression. We'll see if can have an effect on reducing the progression of to the lung injury, to ARDS and mortality. Um, this slide is just showing the 
um, latest guideline that was published by the American Thoracic Society and the Infectious Disease Society of America that was published in 2019 about community acquired pneumonia. So as we can see, they, um, they don't recommend uh, routine use of steroids in adults uh, with non-severe uh, community acquired pneumonia, and this is a strong recommendation. And they also, they do not recommend using steroids in, in severe community uh, acquired pneumonia as well, and this is a conditional recommendation. So based on the latest guideline, uh, they don't use, recommend using adjuvant, uh, adjuvant steroids in community acquired pneumonia. Um, yeah, until this uh, came out in 2023, um, which is titled uh, Hydrocortisone in Severe Community Acquired Pneumonia that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, so we'll talk mainly about this randomized control trial and we'll touch base with other uh, randomized control trials uh, published in this topic. So in this trial, they um, they did a double blind RCT in 31 French center. Um, they included people above the age of 18 years uh, who were admitted to the ICU for severe community acquired pneumonia. Um, and the diagnosis was based on the clinical as well as radiographic criteria. Their definition of severe community acquired pneumonia is different than other trials. Um, uh, in their definition, any person who required mechanical ventilation, either an invasive one or non invasive one, in terms of a BiPAP, for example, uh, they were considered as a severe community acquired pneumonia. Uh, initiation of high fl uh, flow nasal cannula with a FIO2 of more than 50%. Um, needing non-rebreather mask with a ratio uh, of PaO2 over the FiO2 of less than 300. And they also included people who had scored more than 130 on the pulmonary severity index. They have a couple of exclusion criteria. Um, where some are mentioned here. Uh, they didn't include any people who had do not intubate order or pneumonia that caused was caused by influenza virus or septic shock. And um, so obviously uh, both groups, the hydrocortisone group as well as the, um, the placebo group, um, both uh, the patient received antibiotics based on the, or uh, were at the discretion of the responsible team. So this is just a slide showing the pneumonia severity index. It's a scoring system based on demographic, based on, sorry, based on comorbidities, based on physical and lab findings. Um, so uh, this is just to help uh, triage people at the emergency uh, into outpatient treatment versus inpatient treatment. And as we can see, the highest class is class five and um, a score more than 130. So in this trial, they included people who scored more than 130. Um, this is uh, the randomization process. So as I said, all patients were treated with appropriate antibiotic and supportive care. So they had two groups, the hydrocortisone group, as well as the placebo group. In the hydrocortisone group, they uh, received around 200 milligram a day for four days. And they received that dose within 24 hours from presentation to the hospital. And this is a critical point to mention is that the randomization happened early on um, uh, during uh, admission process. Um, the duration for therapy uh, was pre um, was different between uh, people. Some people got treated for eight days. Some people got treated for 14 days, and that was depending on the uh, on a predefined criteria, uh, and all people, um, um, this uh, all 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 patients uh, received who received steroid discontinued the therapy at the time of discharge from the ICU. And during the randomization, they randomized people and they stratified people according to the trial center, to the ICU center, as well as the use of non um, the use of mechanical ventilation.
Um, so this is the screening process and randomization process. They had around 6,000 patients who got admitted to the ICU for community acquired pneumonia, and they excluded uh, a lot of them due to different reasons. As we said, they had the exclusion criteria for septic shock people. They excluded people who had uh, do not intubate order. Uh, they excluded people who had cystic fibrosis and post obstructive pneumonia. Um, and many others. So they ended up with 800 who underwent the randomization. Around 400 received the hydrocortisone group, um, and around 400 uh, were at the placebo group. So this is the baseline characteristic of the patients. As we can see, um, the baseline is similar between the two groups in terms of the age, in terms of the um, in terms of the sex, um, in terms of the coexisting conditions. Um, and obviously, it's also similar um, between the two groups in terms of the severity of the pneumonia. As we can see here in the SOFA score is similar between the two groups, um, and the SAP score is similar between the two groups. Um, as well as the C-reactive protein, which is one of the markers for uh, um, inflammation, is similar between the two groups. Um, and in the last part here, we can see that the median interval time from the hospital admission to the ICU uh, were around 5.5 hours, and the median time from ICU admission to the initiation of therapy is around 15.3 hours. So most people got treated within around 20 hours of, of uh, admission. The coexisting condition here um, were probably, they probably based on the um, medical records rather than having a clear diagnostic uh, process. So they just reviewed the medical records and um, uh, they mentioned the diagnosis of COPD and asthma and diabetes and immunosuppression. Um, so this is the outcomes of interest. So this is the, the study death at day 28 as a primary outcome. And they study um, a, a lot of secondary outcomes, including uh, death at 90 days and length of ICU stay uh, and others. Um, and they also study safety outcomes as well. They study the incidence of secondary infections, the incidence of GI bleeding by 28, and the incidence of insulin by day seven and weight gain by day seven. So this is the results of the study. Um, as we can see, this is the primary outcome, as I said, death by day 28. And um, as we can see here in the hydrocortisone group, around 25 uh, people died by day 28, um, um, over 400 people with um, a percentage 6.2 in comparison to the placebo group, which is 11.9% uh, um, with a difference of minus 5.6 with a p-value of 0 0.006, indicating uh, that there is a significant difference between the two groups in terms of death. And they also, as I said, they studied um, uh, secondary outcomes, death by day 90. And as we can see here from the, um, the confidence interval, there is uh, a changes uh, or a significant change in terms of death by day 90. But they didn't include the p-value because um, they wanted uh, this data to be exploratory rather than a confirmatory testing because they didn't adjust for multiplicity here. They also studied the incidence of intubation by day 28, and as we can see, uh, that the incidence of intubation in the hydrocortisone is much, much less than the placebo group, um, as well as the incidence of non-invasive ventilation by, by day 28 is much less in the hydrocortisone group than the placebo group. Um, so which, which group experienced the greatest benefit? 
Um, so as we mentioned, that death by 20 uh, by day 28 was just much less in the hydrocortisone group than the placebo group. Um, this is mainly in those uh, people. They did a, a subgroup analysis, um, and as we can see in this graph, in this forest plot graph, that there is the main benefit was seen in people who did not require mechanical ventilation, um, who did not have an isolated bacteria. Who, who are above the age of 65 and um, women also um, uh, benefited more from this than men, as well as the severity of, um, um, I mean, the, the marker for inflammation by CRP. As we can see here, CRP of more than 15 milligram per deciliter, they, greater, uh, they had the greatest benefit compared to people who did not have a, that high CRP. So we can say that people who um, who who required who did not require mechanical ventilation, elderly uh, people above the age of 65, women, and people who had high CRP levels benefited the most from uh, hydrocortisone group from hydrocortisone. Um, so this is the Kaplan-Meier graph showing. Um, another outcome, which is discharge from the ICU by day 28 and comparing those who received corticosteroid uh, with the placebo we can see that the hydrocortisone group the orange line over here had a higher and quicker discharge rate compared to the placebo um, and as we can see the hazard ratio was 1.33 with a confidence interval that doesn't contain one it's between 1.16 to 1.52 So this is the safety outcomes. As we said, um, they studied the incidence of infection. They studied the incidence of GI bleed. Uh, they studied the in uh, incidence of uh, the need for more insulin in those people. And what we can see is that there was no differences between the two groups in terms of GI bleeding, in terms of bacteria infection. But there was much higher need for insulin in people who had really hydrocortisone group by around 8.7 units. So people who had hydrocortisone had more insulin by 8.7, a median of 8.7 with a p-value of less than 0 0.001. So, um, in summary, so this is just to show that this trial showed and supports the use for early hydrocortisone. And this is to the people who had severe community acquired pneumonia uh, who required ICU level of care. Um, and obviously, um, in, in order to confirm these findings, we need follow up studies to explore the steroid regimen is it hydrocortisone the best is prednisone is it methylbred um, and to also study the tapering strategies as well as the management for the complication including hyperglycemia so this concludes um the main um, the main uh, randomized control trial that we wanted to discuss so we've looked into also other randomized controlled trial about this topic. Um, there is um, this is a study that was published in JAMA in 2015 about the effect of corticosteroid on treatment failure among hospitalized patients with severe community acquired pneumonia and high inflammatory response. So this is a multi-center um, randomized control trial that was between 2004 and 2012. They included people uh, above the age of 18 with clinical and radiographic evidence of pneumonia, but they also had this criteria. They only included people who had a CRP of more than 150 milligram per liter. Um, and uh, they included people who had severe community acquired pneumonia based on the um, American Thoracic Society uh, criteria for severity. So they randomized people to hydro uh, in this trial. They randomized people to methyl bread rather than hydrocort, and they gave them a 0.5 milligram per kg uh, twice a day. Um, uh, and the other group received placebo. And the duration for therapy in this trial was just five days. 
and they allowed up to 36 hours of admission. Um, and, um, and this is in comparison to the first trial where they only took people who were randomized within 24 hours. The primary outcome was uh, rather than mortality was treatment failure. And this was a composite um, um, outcome. They included early treatment failure and late treatment failure. And we'll touch base uh, about um, the meaning of early versus late treatment failure. Um, so this is the, the outcomes, and this is what they found. Um, we can see that, as we've discussed, the primary outcome was treatment failure, and we can see that uh, around 13% of the people who got methyl bread um, uh, developed treatment failure. Uh, in comparison to 31% of the placebo group with a p-value of less than 0 0.05, p-value of 0 0.02, indicating that there is a, st a statistical significance between the two groups. And this effect is mainly seen to the people who had, sorry, um, this effect is mainly seen to the, um, mainly because of late treatment failure. Um, as we can see here, the um, 3% of people who got methyl bread develop late treatment failure, whereas, whereas around 25% of the people who had the, uh, who had the placebo developed treatment failure. Um, and that late, uh, late treatment failure was due to radiographic progression, more than 50% progression in their uh, chest X-ray. Um, and they also, in this study, they studied the other outcomes, including death, which is in hospital mortality, which is not shown in this uh, table. Uh, and they didn't find any significant difference between the two groups in terms of in hospital mortality. So to summarize, um, so the methyl bread uh, reduced the treatment failure in patients with severe community acquired pneumonia who had high inflammatory markers, including CRP of more than 150, lowering the failure rate between 31% to 13%. And this, as I said, the benefit was primarily seen in, in terms of radiographic progression and in terms of the incidence of late onset septic shock. Um, and as I said, as a secondary outcome, they studied, um, they studied the uh, mortality uh, and they didn't find any difference in terms of mortality in this trial. Um, so the only uh, they their primary outcome was um, a treatment failure. So because of that, the sample size was chosen based on that, and that may lead to um, and that may explain why there is no difference in mortality. Um, so this is um, this will conclude my uh, talk about this, and I'll, I'll hand it over to Mahdi to speak about uh, two randomized control time about this topic. Hello, hi. Uh, thank you, Mahad, for presenting the first half of the presentation. Um, I will be talking next. Uh, the next couple of slides will be about uh, three different uh, studies. The one of them will be most largely published in 2024. I will start with the Medura 2022 um, published in Intensive Care Med. So uh, the title of that was Low Dose Methylprednisone Treatment in Critically Ill Patients with Severe Community Acquired Pneumonia. It was a double blind RCT uh, from 2012 to 2016. So they included the patient with severe community acquired pneumonia. And here um, also they, they included the hospital acquired, uh, hospital acquired pneumonia, which is different from the other trials. And these patients should be requiring either intensive care or intermediate care. Uh, the patient were randomized into methylprid group, 40 milligram per day, and um, the dose was tapered over 20 days and versus the placebo group. They were stratified based on the sites and the need for mechanical ventilator at the time of enrollment. So uh, they allowed uh, they allowed sorry for randomization uh, randomization up to 72 96 hours after the admission. The the primary outcome was focusing on 60 day all cause mortality and there are a lot of other uh, secondary uh, outcomes also were involved. 
Uh, so this table, the upper parts, um, represents the, the, the primary outcome. As you can see here, so in the uh, methylpredi group, 47 patients out of 286 passed away. And in the placebo group, 50 patients out of, of, out of 277 passed away. So the, the percentages were roughly um, uh, close to each other. So and the methylpredi was 16% and, and the, the placebo group was 18%. So the odd ratio was around 0.89 and falling in the confidence interval 0 0.8, uh, 0.58 uh, to, 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 uh, to 2, 1.38 with a p-value of 6.1, making it a non-statistically uh, significant difference between these groups. The second part is representing the, uh, the Kaplan-Meier survivor curve. Comparing the methyl, uh, the methyl pred group, you see the solid uh, blue line where the red dash line uh, is the placebo group. And the hazard ratio that uh, was around 0.9, falling in uh, the confidence interval between 0.66 to 1.22. And the p-value was, uh, was 0.5. So making, also, making it not st uh, statistically significant, uh, comparing these two to each other. So uh, in summary for this trial, um, the, uh, so the point why the, there was no statistically uh, differences is one of them is the study found to be not statistically different in, in 60 day mortality between the methylpredi group. So this could be because of the variability in the initiation of uh, of the steroids. So 88% um, of the, of the patient, the steroid was initiated within the 72 hours and Around 22 patients, the uh, the the methyl or the methyl uh, methylpred group started after 72 hours. The other point is the 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 lower than expected mortality rate in placebo group. So it was 18 percent. The anticipated was 27 by the researcher. Uh, that ha uh, might have reduced the study's power to detect meaningful uh, differences. So comparing the trials to each other, there are three main points that maybe make them uh, um, uh, different from each other, or there's a discrepancy between them. So one of the points is the pharmacodynamic properties of the glucocorticoids can vary. Some studies use the hydrocort, uh, which has more mineral corticoid steroids, and the others use the methylpred group. That might play a role in the, the discrepancy between the trials. The other point is the timing of the steroid initiation. In the NEGM trial, the timing was less than 15 hours. And in the intensive care med, the timing was up to 37 hours. This delay in administration of the glucocorticoids uh, might uh, re have reduced the efficacy or the, 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 the optimal window to mitigate the inflammatory damage. Um, the third point, which also the, 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 the primary outcome, some studies studied or focused on the mortality and the other one focused on the treatment failure. So uh, the next one is the, the system, a systematic review published in a Journal of Critical Care. This is the most recent one in 2024. It was a systematic review talking about the efficacy and safety of corticosteroids for the treatment of community acquired in pneumonia. So there were at least 15 studies published between 1972 and, two, uh, and 2023. Around 8,600 patients were included. So uh, the, the most of the patients were involved to be to have severe community acquired pneumonia, but also a non-severe patient where uh, some of them were not severe community acquired pneumonia were also involved in the trial. Uh, there were different regimens of steroids used, and the key primary outcome was all-cause mortality at 30 days. However, if the mortality uh, was not reported at 30 days, it was extracted closest to the uh, to 30 days. And also there were uh, um, um, another uh, secondary outcomes that were uh, involved. This forest plot, as you can see, um, include all the studies. Um, so including our study that we've talked about, the Dipquin study that 2023, the Medora study 2022, and also to uh, Torres study in 2015. So the pooled risk ratio was around 0.69. And uh, that with a 95% confidence interval between 0.53 to uh, 0.89. The, 
uh, and the p-value of around um, 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 0 0.004 as you can see here. So making it statistically significant, there is a statistically significant benefit of using corticosteroids. Um, the heterogeneity, um, while the I squared was 12%, makes it there is a low variability between studies. The overall quality of evidence was evaluated and it was high due to the absence of significant concerns between the great domains. For quality assessment of trials, the risk of bias, overall, all the trials have a either low to moderate trials of biases. However, three trials, the, especially the Marek 1983, uh, Al Gamrawi in 2006, and McHardy, they had a high risk of bias, uh, mainly falling into the randomization process, the deviations from the intended interventions and measurements of the outcomes. So for the, system, uh, the sensitivity analysis, they, they, these studies were uh, removed. And so the system, although they were removed, the, system, the sensitivity analysis did not change uh, the result substantially. So the relative risk ratio was 0.69, with a confidence in, uh, the 95% confidence interval falling between 0.94 to, uh, sorry, 0.5 to 0.94 with the, the, the I squared or the heterogeneity was 29%, make it, it, making it moderate variability between the studies. So uh, in summary, uh, the corticosteroids, particularly the hydrocortisone, reduces the risk of all-cause mortality in patients with high disease burden, severe community-acquired pneumonia. The corticosteroids probably decreased the need for mechanical ventilator. Uh, vasopressors and the length of hospital and ICU stay, which is this is a secondary outcome. Patients with severe community acquired pneumonia will likely benefit from adjunctive corticosteroid therapy. Uh, there is no significant increase in secondary infections or GI bleed reported, but it was associated with increased insulin requirements. And that will bring, you, uh, bring me up to my last slide, which is the questions. Thank you guys for having us and giving us this opportunity to do this presentation. <clears throat> Thank you, Moath and um, uh, Madi. Um, anybody have any questions? Please put them into the uh, Q&A uh, 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 section, or you can raise your hand, and I'll try and give you access. Um, I don't see any questions yet in the the question. I'm just going to start off with a, a quick question. Then um, you mentioned that. A lot of this uh, this talk is in severe pneumonia, and you even showed some data showing that um, in influenza, the guidelines say not to give steroids. Uh, having finished the from a few years ago with COVID, we saw that dexamethasone was heavily effective in COVID. Um, why do you think that steroids was beneficial in a viral infection such as COVID, but maybe not in influenza? Yeah, so they didn't, in these trials, they didn't include people who had influenza. They thought they may um, affected the outcomes, which is mainly studying people who had bacteria pneumonia. Um, so this was the main uh, focus in these trials, rather than focusing in people who had viral infections. But doesn't it doesn't say exactly if it is a contraindication to use steroids and influenza pneumonia. Right. Uh, thank you. So, Dr. Korovo, who is also the, the supervisor for this project, this talk, is asking, uh, how will this change your management and will this change your management of what you've been doing at all? Yeah, I think um, depending on the severity of the uh, disease, and the, the, uh, the severity of the pneumonia, if people need, for example, high flow, if people need BiPAP to uh, oxygenate and ventilate them. Um, I would consider um, steroid um, giving the out the, given the evidence that we have right now. Um, yeah, mainly for severe acquired pneumonia, I would consider I will change my management and consider steroid as an adjunct of therapy. Yep. Uh, Dr. Hunt has a question. He's asking. Do you think the data you presented will lead to a change in the guidelines? 
Um, yeah, I think uh, given that, so the more, so the most recent one, the meta analysis showed like there is a significant change and and um, all like was significant, or statistically significant the differences between the groups and help the patients. So I think the data or the guidelines will start to change, uh, but maybe they they might need more uh, studies before doing that. But I think given that the most recent one, the meta-analysis showed that there is a significant change or improvement in patients with uh, severe community acquired pneumonia, I think this will, uh, this will happen. Um, just looking to see if there's any other questions. Anybody have their hand up or want to type anything in the Q&A? As we wait for that, uh, I have a question. We have another question. Um, oh, this is just a comment saying, well presented. Uh, I have another question for you then uh, while we wait for any other additional questions. Uh, Moat, when you presented your um, criteria in the um, patients who were seen in the uh, Paris study, um, it showed ICU patients, but not intubated. Um, do you think when you extrapolate that data, how does that meet to the management we do here in Hamilton as we have a lot of level two ICUs or step downs? Do you think that this data will change how we manage pneumonia that needs step down level care, not necessarily our level three level ICUs? Yeah, I think so. This is uh, this is the aim of this topic is to um, to say about the um, I mean, the audience is obviously uh, the internal medicine physicians. And as we can see in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine, they included people who required high flow nasal cannula in this trial. And obviously there is a benefit of hydrocortisone in those people. So not only people who get ventilated who sent to the ICU benefited from hydrocortisone, but also people who had high flow nasal cannula who required non-rebreather also benefit from steroid as well. So I would I would say yeah that's um, will change our management as a internist um, for high, for the severe community acquired pneumonia. We will consider steroid as an adjunctive therapy in those people. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hunt has another question, and he's asking, would you apply the results that you've seen to hospital acquired pneumonia? Um, so the the trials, most of the trials didn't include those people, so it's hard to conclude uh, if there is any benefit of steroid in those people or not. Um, but I would assume, based on just the pathophysiology of the process, is try to controlling the inflammation that there may be a benefit of steroid in these people, but wasn't studied. All right, thank you. Um, I'm just seeing if there's any other questions. Um, um, if there's no other questions, I'd just like to restate Dr. Korovo's um, comment of uh, great job, Madi and Moath, well presented. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm just going to see if there's no other questions. I think we'll we'll finish a, a little bit early today. Thank you very much. And um, everybody have a, a wonderful day today. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.